The good old days. Boys are boys from the beginning. If you were born a boy, you stay a boy. Girls are girls right from the start. If you were born a girl, you stay a girl Gosh, and grow up to be it. a lady. Only girls can be the mommies. Only boys can be the daddies. Yes, sir. Mr. Rogers, I think he's going to make a comeback. Sarah McBride doesn't get a say in this. This is a biological man trying to force himself into women's spaces, and I'm not going to tolerate You have the radical left that are trying to erase women and erase women's rights. I'm the first woman to graduate from the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina. If some guy in a skirt came by and said, no, that's my achievement, I'm going to be there and standing in the way and saying, hell no. I'm not going to allow men to erase women or women's rights. And I'm going to be standing up here. I will file this again next congressional session. Sarah McBride doesn't get a say. This is about women. This is about girls. This is about our rights and being protected in our private spaces. I don't want to see a man in a women's restroom. That's not a thing. And it's not going to be a thing up here. It's not going to be a thing anywhere across the country. As I directly asked uh, Speaker Johnson, um, what the men in our leadership are going to do about this because um, this this has to be stopped. America gave a mandate at this election and said not only are they sick of the open borders, the invasion, the out of control inflation, uh, foreign wars, but they're sick of the trans ideology being shoved down our throats and it's an attack on women and children all over the country. Um, I don't think Nancy Mace's resolution does enough. I think we need to do more. That's what I asked Speaker Johnson and he committed to me in there in the conference that, um, that Sarah Mc bride will not be using our restrooms i want you guys to notice how they're framing this okay they're calling it an anti-transgender bill the negative shade is needed as they particularly want a demographic to be outraged by this thought that's that's what they do but let's dig a little bit deeper into what the republican house representative nancy mace wants to do here okay all she wants to do is to prevent men from using the women's restrooms in the capitol sounds simple enough but of course mainstream media they don't roll that way it lines right up with representative sarah mcbride being voted into the house of representatives she commented on this via x saying that this is a blatant attempt from far right-wing extremists to distract from the fact that they have no real solutions to what Americans are facing. McBride also added that they were placed into the House to work on bringing down the cost of housing, health care, and child care, not manufacturing culture wars, emphasizing that she's working to make the American dream more affordable and accessible. Now, things became a little bit heated when a reporter from ABC News confronted Mace about this issue. Watch. And so Congresswoman Mace has put forward this bill that would essentially ban, here she comes down the stairs, actually, we're going to try to talk to her as she comes this way, uh, but would ban... Uh, in a sense, a newly elected member of the United States House of Representatives, Sarah McBride, Congressperson Sarah uh, McBride, elect from Delaware, from using, here she goes, here's Congresswoman Mace. Congresswoman Mace, can I ask you a question as you walk here? Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, with your piece of legislation about banning uh, women from 100%, using... yes. Uh, my question to you is... And it doesn't go far enough. I'll you, be filing more bills. You have said that it was created in response to Congresswoman elect McBride. Absolutely, 100 percent. And it, but should it, legislation be created targeted at one specific it, person? It doesn't, it doesn't mention anyone in the legislation, but, but I you've said it, it was aimed at her. No, I have said it's a result of this. I'm not going to allow biological men into women's private spaces. I will stand in the brink and stand in the way of anyone on the radical left who thinks that it's okay for a penis to be in a women's locker room or a bathroom or a changing room. Hell no. Spe I am not going to stand for it. And the speaker said it would be in the House Rules Package. If it's not, I'll be ready with a motion, uh, a privileged motion to force a vote on this. This is not okay. I'm a survivor of rape. I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. And I'm not going to allow any man and any female private spaces. Now, Speaker. Period. End of story. And by the way, I'm getting death threats from men pretending to be women. Why is it that these crazy people, the insanity, the radical left, are willing to kill women over, over a man's right to be in a women's restroom? Speaker it's Johnson crazy. has said, Speaker Johnson has said he wants to treat every new member with the words dignity and respect. Well, he, well, Forcing this congressperson to go into a male restroom, is that dignity and respect? 
forcing women to share private spaces with men is not dignity and not respect. And I'm absolutely going to stand in the way of anyone who thinks it's okay for a man to be in our locker room, in our changing rooms, in our dressing rooms, in women's bathrooms. This guy really wanted a soundbite. And the fact is that progressives believe that you can be whatever you identify as. Maybe they should have the vice president identify as the president-elect of this country and see how that works out for her. That might make them feel a little bit better about their loss. But it won't change the fact that she's not being sworn in by January next year. They seem to have an issue when it comes to reality. And the reality is that Mace is speaking facts. She's going by common sense and science, something that conservatives abide by. But House Speaker Mike Johnson was quoted by this reporter who practically debated with Congresswoman Mace. This is what the speaker had to say when he was asked about this issue. Watch. Mr. Speaker, is freshman-elect Sarah McBride a man or a woman? Um, look, I'm not going to get into this. We, we welcome all new members uh, with open arms who are duly elected representatives of the people. I believe it's a it's a, a, a command that we treat all persons with dignity and respect, and we will. And I'm not going to engage in, uh, in, in silly debates about this. Um, there's a concern about the uses of restroom facilities and locker rooms and all that. This is an issue that Congress has never um, had to address before, and we're going to do that in deliberate uh, fashion uh, with uh, member consensus on it, and we will accommodate the needs of every single person. That's all I'm going to say about that. Hey, do you plan on bringing uh, Nancy Mace's transgender bill and putting that into the rules package? I'm, we're not, I'm not going to address the plans on any of that. I just told you what I'm going to say about the issue. I'm not going to engage in this. We don't look down upon anyone. We treat everybody with dignity and respect. That's a principle that I pursued my whole life, and we will take care of this you know, issue of first impression for Congress, as we will any other thing. Um, we'll, we'll provide appropriate accommodation for every member of Congress. So Mike Johnson lost his backbone for a second there. He had the best opportunity to finish this conversation once or for all, but he backed down. And he seemed to have the answer ready because it sounded very scripted, which is not a good thing for politicians to do as evidenced by this year's presidential election. Now, I'm not really sure what happened, but Johnson may have gotten a call. Maybe he figured it out himself. His answer was weak and it wasn't in line with what he truly believed, leading him to clarify himself, saying that the answer was actually obvious, which resulted in him issuing a policy that now reserves single-sex facilities within the Capitol for individuals of said biological sex. A man is a man, and a woman is a woman, and a man cannot become a woman. But I also believe that we treat everybody with dignity. A decision that's not sitting well with those within the far left, one of them being AOC. So here's what this crazy lady had to say about it. They're endangering women, they're endangering girls of all kinds, and everybody should reject it. It's gross. Do any of you think that this is a danger to women, or is it simply a way to protect them? Many claim that this decision alone will give Republicans success for years to come. It's just a matter of how the American people are going to react to it. But what are your thoughts on this? Benji Backer, founder and executive chairman of the American Conservation Coalition, also said the exact same thing. Kamala Harris and a lot of pro-climate leaders have a lot of hypocrisy with the words that they state and the realities that they must think are real. For him, there's just so much hypocrisy coming from the elitists that everyone else needs to change their lives except for them. And if you think we're done, nope, not even close. I know some of this was already mentioned in the clips, but I think they bear repeating. $12,097 on food delivery from Uber Eats, DoorDash since July. At least $12,081 on ice cream pints and parlors like Sweet Lucy's ice cream, Jenny's Splendid ice creams after President Biden was booted from the top of the ticket. $6,000 $1,000 for a site fee at the Board Game Cafe Snakes and Lattes in Tempe, Arizona, where Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz made a campaign stop to press college students to turn out on election day. $62,772 in room and catering fees at the posh five-star hotel DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware. When Biden's still running for office, a luxury king bed room complete with soaking tub currently ones $500 a night. $9,600 on food and drinks at Pebble Bar near Rockefeller Center, which counts celebs Pete Davidson in March, also while Biden was still the Democratic presidential nominee. As GOP consultant Aaron Perrin put it, nobody should be shocked that Kamala Harris is not being sworn in on January 20. Instead of getting the message out, they wanted to have a party. It's not how this works. And on top of 
of all that, the campaign gave out over $5.6 million to 24 lefty groups, a number of them black or Latino advocacy groups or based in swing states she ended up losing. All of this to help push her agenda and rouse voters. And they're mad over Elon Musk's $1 million giveaways of his own money? Give me a break, guys. At least this was his money and his spending, not other donors. You know what I mean? But really, the crux of the matter is that despite the Harris's campaign's monstrous spending, which combined with aligned interest groups amounted to $1.6 billion, Trump made gains in every state of the union except for Washington since 2020 as he cruised to an election victory. Team Harris, meanwhile, they found themselves somehow saddled with $20 million in debt. And they just ended up outraging Democrats who are now finger pointing at one another and demanding accountability. Well, you know what they say, point one finger and you got three fingers pointing right back at you. Drop a quick yes in the comments, guys. Hit the like button if you guys agree. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Tap the notification bell to show your support. All right, so further proof that America's tired of the Democratic Party and the likes of Kamala Harris, the fact that Deep Blue, New York, and New Jersey saw the largest shifts nationwide toward President-elect Trump in the 2024 election. More precisely, Dave Wasserman, a senior editor and elections analyst with the nonpartisan Cook Political Report, they found an 11.5 percent swing toward Trump in the Empire State and similarly impressive 10.1 percent movement in the Republicans favor in the Garden State compared to the 45th president's 2020 results. Florida, 9.8 percent. Massachusetts, 8.7 percent. California, 8.4 percent. Texas, 8.3 percent. Mississippi, 7.7 percent. Rhode Island, 7 percent. Tennessee, 6.5 percent. And Illinois, 6.4 percent rounded out the top 10. And boy, did Trump make his mark in the blue states. Now, granted, a Republican presidential candidate hasn't won the Democratic stronghold of New Jersey since 1988. It's been even longer in New York, where the last Republican to win was Ronald Reagan in his 1984 landslide over Walter Mondale. But you know what the New Jersey GOP tweeted shortly after Trump's election day win over Vice President Kamala Harris? That New Jersey has become a swing state. Garden State GOP Chairman Bob Hugin said that Democrats have abandoned the working class and it's our opportunity to govern now. New York GOP Chairman Ed Cox added to that and said that under President-elect Donald Trump's leadership, Republicans have broadened our coalition and brought a once-in-a-lifetime shift in our voter base, drawing in working class Americans, voters of color, and younger citizens disillusioned with the status quo. For Cox, New York may be a blue state, but it's a working class blue state, not a progressive, not a woke blue state. And like most of America, they see their state as one where working class families, they want safe neighborhoods, they want affordable housing, good schools, and economic opportunity. Because see, as they pointed out, while Democrats are pushing radical policies and government overreach, from gender ideology and kids sports to banning gas stoves, New Yorkers are concerned about the dual crises of inflation and illegal immigration. And nobody understands that more than President-elect Trump. In fact, if you noticed, he even made a play for both New York and New Jersey on the campaign trail. He held a massive rally in Wildwood, New Jersey in May that drew an estimated crowd of around 80 to 100,000 people, a record for a Garden State political rally. Trump followed that up with rallies in South Bronx, at Croatia Park, and Madison Square Garden in Midtown Manhattan. Who knows? We may see a red New York or a red New Jersey in the near future, guys. What do you say? You guys ready to welcome that to the fold? <laughs> but let me know what you guys think about all this. The Iowa pollster who up and quit after delivering that ridiculous result, Harris spending millions of dollars on private jets and ice cream, and of course, Trump making a red dent on blue strongholds, New York and New Jersey. Six digits spent on ice cream and delivery, not to mention rumors of a paid pollster. What did Kamala Harris do, you guys? Well, you remember that Iowa pollster that dropped a surprise poll showing Harris winning the state all of a sudden? Well, it turns out that that top pollster is now retiring after a supposedly mistaken prediction. Watch. The pollster is retiring. We are uh, talking about uh, this big, big veteran pollster, uh, Ann Seltzer, who um, put out this big, big, um, really a lot of people were talking about it where they're like, okay, is uh, Kamala having a play at Iowa where it had her up by four points? That didn't turn out to be the case, but uh, now we are learning that the veteran pollster Ann Seltzer announced that she was done with the election polling and moving on to other ventures after her pre-election poll in Iowa inaccurately showed Vice President Kamala Harris a ahead of President-elect Donald Trump in the state he had easily won in 2016 and 2020. 
Over a year ago, I advised the register I would not renew when my 2024 contract expired with the latest election poll as I transition to other ventures and opportunities, Seltzer explained in an op-ed on Sunday in the Des Moines Register. So um, that is what a lot of people are talking about now, uh, truly here. And uh, some on social media were saying, okay, uh, did did this have anything to do with her maybe retiring and then wanting to put out something that was maybe pro-Harris? Well, that she is uh, rebuffing that and saying, no, I had this planned for a while. She said that she had this plan for a while, but do we really believe her? Hearing about this news, President-elect Trump commented on Truth Social that what she did was a totally fake poll and it caused great distrust and uncertainty at a very critical time. And for Trump, the Iowa pollster knew exactly what she was doing and he didn't miss a beat either. He said, thank you to the great people of Iowa for giving me such a record-breaking vote. Despite possible election fraud by Ann Selzer and the now discredited newspaper for which he works. He also said that an investigation is fully called for. Honestly, all I know right now is finally America is unburdened by what has been. But more precisely, we're now unburdened from that has been, you know what I mean? (laughs) I mean, just look at the wastefulness that they're uncovering in the Harris campaign, spending on private jets and ice cream, all these crazy things. Watch. Despite raising $1.6 billion, Harris's team not only lost to Donald Trump, but is now $20 million in debt. And reckless spending is a major reason for that, as a new report reveals shocking details. The Telegraph claimed the campaign spent $24,000 on food delivery and ice cream. Uber Eats and DoorDash accounted for nearly $15,000, while more than $8,900 was spent on premium ice creams from Sweet Lucy's and Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams. A $6,000 fee went to Arizona Snakes and Lattes board game cafe for a Tim Waltz visit. Private jet travel was another glaring expense. The vice president's team spent $12 million in private flights. In fact, between October 1st and October 17th alone, $2.6 million went to firms like Private Jet Services Group and Advanced Aviation Team. Critics slammed Harris's hypocrisy after she repeatedly called climate change an existential threat. And it wasn't just lavish lifestyle, but even celebrity endorsements drained funds. Last week, an American political commentator asked pop star Cardi B if she was paid to deliver a speech at Harris's rally. Now, Cardi B immediately swung into action, rubbished the reports and claimed that she wasn't paid. Oprah Winfrey, who hosted a Harris town hall, also denied claims of a $1 million payment. A production company, Harpo Productions, clarified it was paid $1 million for production expenses, not Winfrey herself. Extravagant choices extended to ad campaigns and events as well. The campaign spent a staggering $900,000 to reserve ad space at the Las Vegas Sphere, only to lose Nevada by three points. Now, I don't know about you guys, but for me, guys, no party that wastes a billion dollars on a couple of months campaign should ever be in charge of anything. What do you think? Plus the sheer amount of donor money that they wasted on celebrity endorsements. It's just overwhelming. Uh, Ran an incredibly inspired campaign. Inspired and in debt. Reportedly about $20 million worth after blowing through a billion dollars in 110 days. Event production, including concerts and a sit down with Oprah, cost $15 million. Influencers got $3.9 million. And Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network got 500000 Even my three teenage kids told me that Brat Girl Summer is over. So why are you spending millions of dollars on Megan Thee Stallion twerking. So the emails and texts asking supporters for money continue. The DNC tells Fox in a statement, the DNC's work continues in earnest past election day, and so our fundraising is continuing as well. Fundraising first, then messaging. There is universal frustration in this country. Much of it, I actually think, justified. 
See, even AOC admits that there's a lot of frustration in this country and this lavish spending by the Harris Waltz campaign certainly doesn't help their case as a party. Oh yeah, and by the way, breaking news guys, it turns out Oprah Winfrey's production company wasn't paid a million dollars after all. It was even bigger at nearly $2.5 million for the celeb pack town hall that it hosted, more than double the initial estimate reported. This was confirmed by two people familiar with the matter who told the New York Times. But still guys, the TV star has denied receiving receiving any personal payments from the Democrats team and a former advisor to the Harris campaign also said that they did not pay anyone for their appearances or support. Oprah Winfrey said it was set design, lights, cameras, crews, producers, and every other item necessary, including the benches and the chairs that they sat on in order to put on a live production and that she didn't take any personal fees. So two and a half million dollars for a set and lights. Oh, and don't forget the benches and the chairs, right? Those are probably folding chairs from Walmart. <laughs> Yeah, talk about out of touch. Remember when they made headlines? Everybody was talking about the Harris campaign broke records for the most donations compiled in the shortest amount of time. Now, it's also likely one of the most expensive to date with her campaign blowing through one and a half billion dollars in 15 weeks, not to mention saddling the Democratic Party with $20 million in debt. Meanwhile, President-elect Donald Trump trounced Harris in the election, garnering 312 electoral votes. His estimated budget? $720 million. Now, what does that say about Democrats as a party? Basically that they seem to just want to party. Am I right guys? Because it wasn't just these celebrity endorsements. Vice President Kamala Harris's campaign shelled out $2.6 million on private jet travel in the final dying gasps of her presidential run, bringing her failed campaign's total tally on the environmentally unfriendly mode of transportation to a staggering $12 million. These are the same people who are trying to push us to go green. <laughs> Unbelievable, guys. It's even worse when you think about how private jets, which can be up to 14 times more polluting than commercial flights, they fly in the face of their 2019 doom saying that the global warming is an existential threat to humanity, as well as her own calls on the campaign trail for Americans to reduce their carbon emissions to stop global warming. Meanwhile, they're rolling up in private jets constantly destroying our ozone layer. How hypocritical, right? Hypocrisy is what my uncle will call it. Now, speaking of success, there are those still within the left that are dumbfounded as to how Kamala Harris lost the election. One of them is William Shatner. Now, I covered this in a previous video, guys, where another liberal, Bill Mayer, sets him straight as to what happened. So anyway, make sure you guys check that video out after this one. As always, appreciate you guys hitting the like button and subscribing. Check out this video here coming up next, and I'll see you guys next time.